morning, church. Thank you, TJ, for reading that passage for us. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Grant Glover, and I work with the college ministry here at PCBC. If you haven't gotten a chance to meet me, you may have seen me around from time to time as I grew up in the youth ministry here and also worked with the youth ministry. So if you haven't got a chance to meet me, please come up and introduce yourself afterwards. I would love to get a chance to meet with any of you. Or if you're watching online, please feel free to shoot me an email. I would love to get a chance to talk with any of you. I first just want to say that I'm super grateful to be in a church like this that is so dedicated to equipping young people for, like me for ministry. PCBC has always been so supportive of me. It's the place where I have grown, where I have felt called to ministry, and where all of you have loved me in so many different ways, so I really just can't thank you all enough. And because I'm young, I want to start off this morning by explaining a common dating term that gets thrown around, and that's called the DTR. If you've ever heard somebody say that they DTR'd last night, that means that they defined the relationship. And for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, let me explain. It's basically when two people have been going on dates, and they decide to go from going on dates to dating. It's a conversation they have somewhere between dates three and six where they sit down and ask, okay, what are we? Are we official? And at the end, they decide that they have become committed and they are now in a relationship. And when one of the boys comes home from the DTR, we're there to pump him up, celebrate him, fist bumping, chest bumping. No clue what the girls do. But for the boys, we're there to be the hype squad. The DTR is essentially the marker where the relationship has officially begun. But obviously, just because you've DTR'd with somebody doesn't mean you're going to get married to them. In dating, there are always these lingering doubts and insecurities and fears over whether the person will stay faithful and committed to me. And so there's always this element of performing in a dating relationship to keep the person in relationship with me. And what's interesting about that is that we experience similar feelings in our relationship with God. We think we know where we stand with him. We think he's at least somewhat pleased with us. But then we go through some moral failures where we keep failing in the same way over and over and over again. And we wonder, is he tired of forgiving me? Or we look at our life and realize that we don't really live like God the way we should. And we sit there and we wonder, how could I be a Christian if that's what my life looks like? Or we begin to feel a little apathetic about church and like meh about our faith, and we realize how little we love God, and then we sit and wonder, how could God love someone like me who loves him so little? When we start to realize our faithlessness, we begin to have these questions and doubts about God's faithfulness toward us. What we need to, what we need to see is how we know that God is faithful especially when it doesn't look like it or when it, feel, or when it doesn't feel like he is. We will answer the question today, why is God faithful and what does it look like? The passage we'll go through to answer that is from Deuteronomy 7, which TJ just read for us. And it, Deuteronomy is a book of the Old Testament where Moses is delivering these sermons to the people of Israel after they have left Egypt, they've left slavery in Egypt behind, and he's giving them these sermons to tell them what God has done for them, how he feels about them, and how he wants to be in relationship with them. So essentially, Deuteronomy is kind of like the DTR between Israel and God, where they know exactly how they're supposed to be in relationship with him. Except in this relationship, God will be shown to not be like some fickle boyfriend, but he will be shown to be entirely faithful. Now, you could be wondering how this is true with that scary-looking verse 10 that was just read, where God talks about destroying people and all this hatred, but don't go anywhere. We'll come back to that. You want to keep your Bibles open to Deuteronomy 7, and in it today, we will see the wrong reason for thinking he's faithful, the real reason, the result and the trust we can have. The wrong reason, the real reason, the result, and the trust. So first, we will look at why we normally think God is faithful, which is the wrong reason. If you'll look with me at Deuteronomy 7, uh, verse 7, God says, it was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples. 
Do you see what God is saying is not the reason that he loved them and chose them? He's saying I didn't choose you because you were convenient. I didn't choose you because you were beneficial to me. And how do we know this is the case? Well, when God rescued Israel from slavery, they were actually a pretty small and powerless nation. And God, to be honest, had lots of better options to pick from at the time. You had the Egyptians, the Hittites, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, all who had these massive militaries, massive cities, immense wealth, yet God chose a group of people who were slaves, And what's really interesting about this is that this was revolutionary and incredibly progressive for its time because at that time, people thought that the most powerful gods belonged to the most powerful people. For example, whenever a city would become the capital of a country, that god, the god of that city would become the most powerful god in that nation. And so do you see what this means? It means that God did the exact opposite of what people were expecting. He did not choose The all-powerful God did not choose a powerful people. He chose a bunch of poor, uneducated slaves of little status to be his people. And that means he didn't choose them for the benefits they brought to him. Yet he calls Israel, even though they were this small, powerless people, he calls them a treasure. But he doesn't say that he loved them because they were a treasure. He says that they're a treasure because he loved them. And so, not only... Does God say, I didn't choose you because you, were, you weren't of any benefit to me, but he also acknowledges that it was not because Israel was more moral or obedient that he brought them out of Egypt. If you notice down in verse 6, the very beginning, he says, for you are a people holy to the Lord your God. But they hadn't really done anything to be considered holy yet, so how could he call them holy? Well, it's because God's talking about holiness in a way, in a different way than we normally talk about it. He's not referring to holiness like Justin Bieber does in his song, Holy, if you're familiar, where he's professing his love to his wife, Haley, and in his own words, he's talking about holiness as a lifestyle. Now, that's getting close to what the idea is, being a lifestyle, but God's talking about something slightly different here. To be holy is to be set apart. And so God sets apart Israel as a people before they become morally set apart. And this is kind of the exact opposite of what we would expect from the Old Testament. We normally think of God as legalistic, demanding, impatient, angry, fed up. But it can be easy to forget that the law was given not before Israel was brought out of Egypt, but after. God loves Israel first and then gives the law. He does not ask them to follow the law and be obedient for him to love them. He loves them before they do anything for him or perform for him in any way. And he promises to remain faithful to them and love them regardless of how well they carry out the law. And so how does this apply to us? It means that though we tend to think God's faithfulness depends on ours, on, our, on our, us being beneficial to him or being obedient to him, or we have to perform to receive his faithfulness, That is not why he's faithful. His faithfulness does not depend on our faithfulness. We find ourselves thinking that if I do something good, I'll receive something good in return, but do you see what that means? It means that we are trusting in ourselves to earn something from him, that we are in some kind of transactional relationship where we are exchanging faithfulness to God, like we do with other people, And when we think that his faithfulness depends on ours, on our own track record, it will lead to only one of two things, either religious pride or crushing self-doubt. If we think that God's faithfulness depends on ours and we think that we're performing well and being faithful, then we will begin to lose our sense of neediness. We will compare ourselves and think ourselves better than others and think that God owes us something in return and become frustrated when he does not deliver. Or, if we think that his faithfulness depends on ours, and we perceive ourselves as being unfaithful, then there will always be these lingering doubts and insecurities about whether he's angry or upset with us. We We will be in doubt of the kind of people we are and question, how could God love someone like me? And both of these miss the mark because his faithfulness does not depend on our faithfulness. Your performance does not dictate his faithfulness to you. 
But the problem is that is our natural mode because that's how we interact with other people. So which camp do you fall in? Do you tend to think that God ought to make your life go well because of how much money you've given or how moral you are or how put together your family is? Or do you find yourself always wondering if he is upset or angry with you or doubting his love for you because of your repeated lust or your selfishness towards your friends or your lack of generosity? To avoid both of these errors, the religious pride and the crushing self-doubt, we have to look somewhere else besides ourselves to see God's faithfulness. So why is he faithful? This brings us to our second point, the real reason why he is faithful. If you'll look down back at Deuteronomy 7, in verse 7, God clarifies that it's not because of who Israel was that he loved them, but he says that he brought them out with a mighty hand and redeemed them from the house of Egypt from Pharaoh because he loved them. And he says in 9, therefore, know therefore that the Lord your God is God, and he calls himself the faithful God. And then he proceeds to explain why he's faithful. It's because he's the God who keeps covenant and steadfast love. Now that word steadfast love there could be translated in your Bibles as love or loving kindness, steadfast love. And all of these are translations of the Hebrew word hesed. Now, because I'm a nerd and because I have spent thousands of dollars learning Hebrew in seminary classes, I feel like I have to tell you that it's really pronounced hesed. But to spare myself and anyone else from getting a sore throat this morning, we're going to drop the ch and we're going to go with hesed. You see, in the Old Testament, God is described over and over again as the God of Hesed. And, he, and the problem is, we don't have a good word in English to fully capture that idea. You see, Hesed doesn't mean just normal, emotional human love, but Hesed means a committed love that is given regardless of how the other person performs in the relationship. You see, Hesed is talking about how that God loves people whether or not they deserve this love. And that means that God loves Israel and us without expecting anything in return. God loves no matter how much he's loved back. And that means that there are not conditions. You don't have to be a certain way for him to love you. If he remained faithful to Israel through all of their failings and loved them regardless, then he can remain faithful to us. And that's because the real reason he's faithful has nothing to do with you. His faithfulness is based only on his grace. His unconditional love means that he's unconditionally committed and faithful to you, even though you are not unconditionally faithful back to him. That is Hesed. And I can only think to illustrate this in one way. It's a sermon illustration. I recently heard from Tim Keller, who admittedly stole it from somebody else, so I'm kind of stealing something that was already stolen. But there was this preacher years ago who was trying to illustrate how God loves people, and he told all the men in the crowd to not do the following. So naturally, I perked up and paid attention. And he says that when a wife comes to her husband one day and asks, do you love me? He should respond back, well, of course I do. But then she might ask, but why do you love me? At this point, he has to be thinking, this is a trap. <laughs> I'm being questioned, and a certain answer is expected. So he racks his brain, and he says, well, it's because you're just so beautiful. He thinks he's done well, but this responds back, but what happens when I start aging a little bit and my beauty fades? Would you love me less? Uh-oh. He thinks again, and he says, well, it's also because of your amazing personality. But what happens if I go through a season of depression and I lose my personality a little bit? Would you love me less? Well, it's also because of how active we are together and how much fun we get to have. But what if I were in an accident and couldn't do the things we love to do anymore? I mean, this guy is really on the ropes here. And he goes, well, it's also because of your amazing character. But she says, but what if I have a moral lapse? Would you love me less? What's the point? All the reasons he gave for loving her were conditional. They were things that she provided for him. Which means that he was loving her not for her, 
but for what she could bring him as if she were some kind of product. Those things may have been the occasion for his love, the things that drew him towards her, but his love runs deeper than that. The only unconditional love then is to say, I love you just because I love you. And this kind of love, I love you just because I love you, is hesed, and it is what we desire deeply to hear in life. It is what we, our hearts crave to have somebody who loves us no matter who we are or what we do, and we tend to look for it out in the world to find somebody who loves us this way, and it's why we do a lot of what we do to get people to love us for our, for our performance, our success, our wealth, or our physical attraction. It's why we care about the clothes we wear, the car we drive, the house we live in, the, the way our bodies look, our social media presence, the title we tell people that we have. It's also why wrecked and ruined relationships and harsh comments absolutely crush us because we desire deeply to be loved in this way, but every love we chase after in the world can change its mind or be taken away in an instant. And so we try to make people love us for what we do, what we say, and we essentially become products for them to consume, to give them what they want. But the only place to find the unconditional love, the I love you just because I love you love, where you're loved not for what you produce, is in God. When he DTRs with you, he doesn't then ask for you to perform for him to remain faithful to you. He doesn't love us for what we can give him for some kind of product. He doesn't love us because of our church attendance, our financial giving, or how moral we are. It means that you cannot increase his love for you in any way because he loves you, because he loves you, because he loves you. And if he loves you that way, then he is faithful only because of grace. And if he has loved you by grace, by hesed, then that means he will continue to do so, and that means that your current performance, how you were this week, does not impact his faithfulness to you. I know I personally fall into the trap of feeling bad for how little I love him. Though I do not pray enough or spend enough time in the word, though I am not generous enough, I do not live for him enough, I fail him before lunch every day, and I know all the junk that's going on up here and in here. He still loves me because it's unconditional. And that means for you that whenever you click on another video that you shouldn't, again, or have one too many drinks, again, or treat your family terribly, again, you will keep finding nothing but unconditional love and grace whenever you come back to him. And he will remain faithful to, to you. Do you believe that? It might be hard for you to fully believe that because of how unfaithful other people have been in your life. Maybe you've had an unfaithful boyfriend or girlfriend, an unfaithful spouse, an unfaithful friend, or an unfaithful family member. God is not like the other people in your life. And he wants you to know that. He is faithful to you not because of your faithfulness back to him, but in spite of your faithlessness. In spite of your track record, he loves you because he's faithful to you not because of who you are, but because of who he is. You are not defined by what you do. So who is God to you? Is he right now like a frustrated employer, an angry judge, or a worn out father, constantly waiting for you to get your act together? Do you find yourself constantly thinking that you have to get back in the right with him or get back close to him as if he weren't unconditionally committed to you and faithful to you already? Do you see that he's only faithful to you just because of how deeply he cares about you? Now, that might be why he's faithful, but that still leaves us with the question, what does his faithfulness look like? How will it show up in my life? And this brings us to our third point, the result of his faithfulness. You can look back down at Deuteronomy 7, verse 11, which says, you shall therefore be careful to do the commandment and the statutes and the rules that I command you today. Do you see that therefore? It means that God is saying, in response to everything I've just said about myself to you, you are to therefore obey what I've said. And he doesn't tell them to obey to attain his faithfulness, 
but in response to it. And that completely changes the order of things. It means that you don't obey to get something from God, but you obey to respond because you're simply grateful for what God has done for you already. While religion says that you may have to perform to receive something from God, the gospel says you have received his unconditional love and you've been fully accepted already. Therefore, you obey him just because you enjoy him, because you're grateful. Let me show you what this is like. Imagine you are a performer in a high school play and you have this big production coming up and you hear that there are going to be talent scouts from Broadway ready to give parts to these high schoolers in well-known plays. Now, I know this sounds a little dramatic and a little unrealistic and a little like the ending to High School Musical, but bear with me. Imagine you're, you're, the performance is about to start and you're nervous, you're worked up, wondering what are they going to think about me? How will they think about my performance? How are they going to think of how good of an actor or actress I am? Until one of those scouts comes up to you before it starts and says, hey, no matter how it goes tonight, no matter what your performance looks like, we want you on Broadway. Think of the relief that would wash over you in that moment. You would feel accepted and validated. And so what would the performance become to you? Enjoyment. You would act out of sheer gratitude and just be grateful for the opportunity and not having to perform and not having any pressure to having to please somebody. And this is what God does for you. He loves you before you perform, before you do anything for him, which means your life spent with him is simply just living in gratitude for what he has already done. There is no hint of having to perform to gain any acceptance or blessing out of him. That means the result of his faithfulness is that it creates gratitude in us. His faithfulness means he will continue to show you his unconditional love so that we will become more grateful for who he is. And do you want to know when that's going to happen? It will happen when you fail him and you are not grateful for him and you disobey him, but you come back to him and find nothing but grace. And then you fail again and again, and again, and you keep on finding nothing but love and forgiveness and grace from him. When you keep on seeing how faithless you are and are met with nothing but love from him, you will experience more and more gratitude. And that's what his faithfulness does for you. And if that's what his faithfulness is about, then that means his faithfulness is not about answering all of your requests when you bring them to him. And this is the difficult part of his faithfulness. You could be sitting out there thinking, how is he being faithful to me by making me stay single for so long and having me get rejected over and over and over again, wondering if anyone would love me? Or how could he have me get rejected by that school? Or how could he be faithful to me by having me get fired from that job without anything else on the horizon? Well, it's because sometimes he wants you to see how good he is just by himself. If God said yes to every request the moment you brought it to him, he would be nothing but just a means to an end. He would just be the way, the divine vending machine for you to get what you really want. And God wants to become instead the end of your life. Because he knows that is the only way you will ever be truly satisfied. And do you know what the best thing that he can give you is? More of himself. Do you fully believe that? If he loves you the way he says he does, if it's truly unconditional, then anything else you try to find your worth or value in will not satisfy you and will not bring what it promises. And that means that no amount of wealth, no amount of promotions, no amount of relationships will bring what they, it says they can because the only true unconditional love that delivers on what it promises is found in God. And so that means he'll sometimes have to take away certain things so that you see how good he is in and of himself. And helping you see how good he is to help you be more grateful for who he is, that is the most faithful thing he can do for you to point you to the only place where you can find exactly the kind of love you're looking for. So where can we start on this journey of gratitude? 
Let me suggest one way this morning. If all this is true, that God is faithful to create gratitude in you, then that changes how we pray. His primary goal in prayer is not to answer all of your requests, though sometimes he will, but to show you how good he is just by himself. God wants you to see how you can still be overwhelmed with gratitude even if you didn't have all the other blessings in your life. God wants you to see how good he is in and of himself so that you can just be grateful without anything else attached. And so, before you spend time praying for these specific requests, which you should, you should start your prayers by just thanking God for how gracious and how faithful he is and asking him to change your heart in response to that. Pray, pray that your heart would be changed to just simply fall in love with who he is and how gracious he is. And when you do that, prayer becomes a way for your heart to become closer to his, and you will see how gracious he is and how he keeps forgiving you over and over and over again, and how he, you can be full of gratitude for who he is just in and of himself. Okay, now it's time to deal with that tricky little verse 10. Verse 10. After God goes on and on about how much he loves Israel, how faithful he is to them, how committed he is to them, how he'll never leave them, look down at verse 10. And he will repay to their face those who hate him by destroying them. What? What is going on? Is God going to destroy those who are faithless to him? Perhaps you're wondering, how could the God of justice Keep on forgiving me when I fail him over and over and over again. How do I know that this unconditional love will last? We have good reason, friends, to trust him. And it's where we'll conclude today. If you look back at verse 8, you'll see that it says that God redeemed Israel from the house of slavery. Now, that word for redeemed in the Hebrew doesn't refer to redemption in general, but it refers to a specific kind of redemption that involves a ransom payment to buy a slave out of slavery. This kind of redemption involved a ransom. And we know what Israel did not at that time, that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, God himself, came and made payment for us. He was the ransom. Even though Israel remained horribly unfaithful, Jesus Christ came and paid the price to still redeem them and us and buy us out of slavery. And that means that God never fully destroys Israel, even after all the terrible things they do. But what happened to Christ on the cross? He was whipped and beaten and abandoned by friends spiritually and he was spiritually, physically, and emotionally abandoned. He was whipped and nailed to a cross and crucified like a criminal. And on the cross, he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was destroyed. He paid the price to satisfy God's justice. He was destroyed so that you don't have to be. And that means that God's faithfulness is secure only in the cross. And we can trust him. Instead of bringing the destruction on you, God takes the destruction on himself. And that means that not only were our past failings forgiven, but our present faithlessness, whatever you did this week, was paid for and dealt with already because he took it on himself. He died for our faithlessness so that God can be forever faithful to us. It was Jesus' act of hesed that shows his unconditional love for us, that God loves you, and the only reason he loves you is because he loves you, and we know that because he took on the punishment that we deserved for our faithlessness so that we could receive the reward, the reward he deserved for his faithfulness. If you do not fully believe that or are unsure about that, or need to process God's faithfulness and your faithlessness with somebody, please come talk to any of us after the service or at any time in the coming weeks. We are simply a bunch of people who are faithless, but God loves us anyway, decided to die for us, and we would love to get a chance to talk with any of you. 
God is faithful to you, not because of who you are, but because of who he is, which leads to gratitude. And all of this is secure only in what Christ accomplished on the cross. Let us pray. Father, thank you for today, and thank you for your faithfulness toward us, that no matter how we perform, how we act, you love us unconditionally before we do anything, and you promise to remain by our side, and you show us that you mean it because you were willing to make payment and die on our behalf. I pray that you would remind all of us how faithful you are this week, remind us how, forg how forgiven we are, and that we would simply respond in gratitude and fall more and more in love with who you are and be drawn closer to you each and every day this week and remind everyone here the overwhelming, unconditional love that you will continue to show them. In your name I pray, amen.